Um, welcome. Uh, so I'll, uh, just off the top, uh, I want to invite uh, folks that are sitting in the back to come, come join us at the table. Um, we want this to be as interactive as possible, uh, so please uh, uh, don't be shy. It's okay if you're doing your emails. We won't judge. We just want, we want people to be participating in the conversation as opposed to, you know, 75 or 90 minutes of us talking at you. Um, welcome uh, to today's session, uh, Searching for Standards, the Global Competition to Govern AI. Uh, my name is Michael Karnikolas. I'm the executive director of the UCLA Institute for Technology, Law, and Policy, which is a collaboration between the School of Law and the School of Engineering. And this session is co-presented with the, uh, co-organized co uh, with the Yale Information Society Project and the Georgetown Institute for Technology, Law, and Policy. Our objective today is to foster a conversation on the development of new regulatory trends around the world, particularly through the influence of a few major um, regulatory blocks, uh, uh, particularly China, the US, and the EU, whose influence is increasingly being felt globally, and the tension between rulemaking within these centers of power and the impacts of AI as they're being felt um, outside of this privileged minority. Um, as part of that conversation, we have uh, a fantastic set of panelists. Um, we're not going to be setting aside a specific time at the end for Q&A. Rather, we're hoping to uh, run this session more as uh, an inclusive conversation. So uh, what that means is that after an initial round of short uh, uh, three-minute uh, interventions from each of our panelists, uh, strictly policed three minutes, uh, we will be followed, uh, we'll have a set of discussion questions. And for each of those discussion questions, um, after a couple of interventions from our panel, we're going to be inviting interventions uh, and comments from the rest of you uh, to engage on these questions as well. Um, so please, uh, again, come, for, for those of you who are just joining us in, come, come um, join us here at the table uh, and uh, uh, participate. Um, so uh, without further ado, let's um, kick things off um, with a set of short kind of introductory comments from our panelists uh, to discuss uh, trends in AI governance um, related to their uh, region and area of specialization. Um, out of uh, deference to our uh, wonderful host country, uh, uh, I'm going to start uh, with uh, Kyoko Yoshinaga, who is a project associate professor of the Graduate School of Media and Governance at Keio University, and also an expert at uh, GPAI's Future of Work Working Group. Um, Kyoko. Thank you, Michael. Um, welcome to Japan. Um, I'm Kyoko in Kyoto. Okay. So let me, um, first of all, give you a brief overview of AI regulations in Japan. Japan adopts soft law approach to AI governance horizontally while revising some sector-specific laws. It's not really known worldwide that Japan took the lead in introducing principles for AI research and development um, designed to guide related G7 and OECD discussions. Um, in 2016, the then Internal Affairs Minister, uh, Minister Takaichi, proposed eight principles of AI R&D principles. Um, transparency, controllability, safety, security, privacy, ethics, uh, user assistance, and accountability as non-binding international framework, which was agreed by participating G7 and OECD countries. And it contributed to the OECD's AI principles. Um, Japan has social principles of human-centric AI, which was developed by the Cabinet Office's Council as principles for implementing AI in AI-ready society. And there are seven principles to which society, especially state legislative and administrative bodies, should pay attention, and they are human-centric, education literacy, privacy, ensuring security, fair competition, fairness, accountability, and transparency, and innovation. Then we have AI R&D guidelines made in 2017, uh, which added collaboration 
to the previous eight um, principles of AI R&D principles, which I mentioned earlier, for developers and business operators of AI. And we also have AI utilization guidelines, which consists of 10 principles to address the dangers associated with AI systems. And it was also developed by Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication. But these were for the developers, users, and data providers of AI. This um, user perspective guidelines was made because AI may change its implication and output continuously by learning from data in the process of its users, uh, process of its uses. Also, we have um, governance guidelines for implementation of AI principles issued by Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, um, which guides how to analyze the risks associated with AI system implementations and offers some examples to help organizations adopt suggested principles. So these non-regulatory, non-binding soft laws are used by um, prominent Japanese companies um, to develop their AI policies and communicate them to external parties. As for the sector specific, I wouldn't go into detail right now, but Japan is amending sector specific hard laws, such as the Act on Improving Transparency and Fairness of Digital Platforms and Financial Instruments and Exchange Act which requires businesses to take appropriate measures and disclose information about risks. Also for doctors, there is notification from the ministry that the doctor owe the responsibility of final decision in the treatment that uses AI. So we have soft law approach at horizontal level and com combined with some hard law approach um, by revising existing laws. Thank you. Uh, let's go next to Carlos Afonso Sousa, the director of the Institute for Technology and Society of uh, Rio de Janeiro and a professor at Rio de Janeiro State University Law School. So thanks, Michael, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, among, among friends uh, to discuss uh, this very important topic on think how we think about uh, regulation of uh, uh, AI in, in the region. So in this my brief introduction, just to, to say a bit that uh, it, it seems that even though AI like national strategies uh, do end up like a sharing uh, a common language, uh, of course like different states, uh, they will have different priorities, they will have different approaches, they, and they will have of course uh, different long-term visions um, about like how AI we will end up producing uh, relevant uh, economic, uh, political, and, and cultural changes uh, in, in, in society. And especially when we look uh, in, the, in the region, and by region, uh, I, I think about Latin America, we see that different countries are looking to the, the issue of governance and regulation on it, of AI. And we have, for uh, that specific uh, purpose, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Peru, Mexico, all being very active uh, in this discussion. But one thing that I would like to pinpoint uh, that we can see right now in the region, and I think that's something that we might scale up to a discussion to different regions, is how we're moving through almost like this uh, three-step uh, process in which uh, it all began with a very broad ethical principles about AI that end up turning to a second phase in which different countries end up designing their different national strategies to think about AI. And we now, seems like we are in this third phase in which different countries are actu actually regulating about AI through hard law, through different mechanisms. And that's, I think, one of the, the greatest uh, moments for us to take a look on, especially because uh, governance and regulation on, on itself, uh, it's a form of technology. And we need to understand how are we uh, approaching those different topics concerning the future of AI and making sure that uh, regulation and governance uh, is appropriate to deal with the challenges that we're facing right now, and at the same time, come up with solutions that could be future-proof uh, in terms of the challenges that we are going to face uh, forward. So I'll just stop here in this very brief introduction, but just to, to take 
to provide this quick look on the region and seeing different countries going through this different stage on thinking about national strategies, regulation, and governance tools for, for AI. So thanks, Michael. Perfect. Um, Courtney Raj is the director of the uh, Center for Journalism and Liberty at the Open Markets Institute and a member of the IGF's multi-stakeholder advisory uh, group. Thank you so much. So um, in the United States, the focus right now is on creating frameworks for figuring out what governance of AI should look like and what regulation lo should look like. Uh, and I think one of the challenges is that we talk about AI as if it is a brand new thing without actually thinking about its components and breaking down what exactly it is we mean by AI, including the infrastructure, data, cloud computing, computational power, as well as decision making. So right now, a uh, few of the major kind of regulatory initiatives or standard setting initiatives include the bl blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights by the White House Office of Science, Technology, and Policy, which is mainly focused on risk ma management and mitigation. It includes a set of five principles and associated practices that are designed to help guide the design, use, deployment of automated systems. These are like automated decision-making systems. So again, only one small component of AI designed to protect the rights of the American public in, um, in this age through safe, effective systems dealing with algorithmic discrimination protections, data privacy, notice and explanation, human alternatives, considerations and fallbacks. And it is intended to inform policy decision and guide regulatory agencies and rulemaking, but it is non-binding. Um, the OSTP is soliciting input to develop a comprehensive national AI strategy, and it is focused on promoting fairness and transparency in AI. Meanwhile, the National AI Commission Act, which is a proposal that would create a 20-member multi-stakeholder commission to explore AI regulation within the federal government itself, is focused on responsible AI, and specifically how the responsibility for regulation is distributed across agencies, their capacity to address regulatory challenges, alignment among enforcement ac actions, and a binding risk-based approach uh, much like the EU, I would say. So there is support for the creation of a new federal agency dedicated to regulating AI, which, include, which could include licensing activities for AI technology, although there are al alternative views which think that some of this regulatory um, expertise should be embedded within each individ individual agency. There is also at the federal level the Safe Innovation Framework, which sets priorities for AI legislation, focusing on security, accountability, and protect protecting foundations and explainability, as well as a proposed privacy bill, the American Data Protection and Privacy Act, which would set out rules for AI, including, again, risk assessment obligations. Um, the federal agencies are providing guidance to regulated entities. So, for example, the FTC is regulating deceptive and unfair practices attributed to AI and are increasingly using their antitrust authority to um, impose some antitrust impositions uh, looking at whether they can break it down some companies. I would also um, just add that at least nine states have enacted uh, AI legislation with another 11 with proposed legislation and the um, uh, we need to, I think, look at you know, competition and interventions as well, which is not yet part of the regulatory landscape, but is kind of occurring with some court cases happening alongside uh, these regulatory standard setting initiatives. Thank you. So we have three fantastic uh, panelists in the Zoom as well. Um, let's go first to uh, Simon Chesterman, who is the David Marshall Professor and Vice Provost uh, for Educational Innovation at the National University of Singapore, as well as a Senior Director of AI Governance at AI Singapore. Thanks so much, and I'm sorry not to be there in person, uh, but um, coming from the Singapore and Southeast Asian perspective, uh, I think one of the challenges that every jurisdiction is facing is we're wary both of under-regulating and of over-regulating. Under-regulate and you expose your citizens to risk, over-regulate, uh, and particularly for small jurisdictions, you risk driving innovation elsewhere. Uh, and so when the European Union adopts the AI Act, Meta might determine that it's not going to roll out threads, but it's not going to withdraw from that market completely. 
Uh, if a very small jurisdiction like Singapore adopted something like that, it might lead some of the tech companies to opt out of that jurisdiction uh, completely. So that's one of the sort of uh, baseline considerations that I think is operative here. Um, a second consideration is that in these discussions, certainly over the last eight or so years, the tendency has been to try and come up with new sets of rules, uh, very much like sort of Isaac Asimov laws of robotics that will address this problem of AI. Uh, but as Courtney just said, AI is not that new and indeed laws are not that new. Uh, and I think that kind of approach often misunderstands the problem as too hard and too easy. Too hard in that it assumes that you've got to come up with entirely new rules, whereas uh, a lot of my own work has been essentially arguing that most laws can govern most AI use cases most of the time. But that approach also misunderstands the problem as being too easy because I think it fails to understand that the real devil is in the application. It's in the application of rules to new use cases. So in Singapore's context, rather than coming up with a whole slew of new laws, uh, we have had some tweaks. So for example, the, uh, the Road Traffic Act had to be adjusted so that um, leaving a vehicle unattended wasn't necessarily a crime, which would be a problem for autonomous vehicles and so on. But at the larger level, what we've really focused on is two things, um, human centricity, and transparency. Uh, and the majority of the model AI governance framework that was adopted here uh, back in 2019 is looking at use cases, what this actually means in practice. Uh, because saying that AI shouldn't be biased is merely repeating anti-discrimination laws. Discrimination should be illegal, whether it's done by a person, a company, or by a machine. Uh, but applying that to particular use cases can be a challenge. So recently, Singapore released AI Verify, which is a tool which is intended to help companies police themselves, help organizations police themselves and determine whether or not they're actually holding themselves up to the standards that um, they've been espousing and whether more work needs to be done. Uh, so I'm looking forward to a really interesting discussion, but um, I'll hand the time back to the chair. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, let's go next to uh, Tomiwa Elori. Uh, Tamiwa is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria. Tamiwa, are you there? Oh, yes. Yes, I am. Um, thank you very much, Michael. And quickly to my um, presentation, um, I'll be focusing more on the regional initiatives in Africa on AI governance. And um, quickly, uh, according to the African Observatory on Responsible Artificial Intelligence, there are at least 466 AI policy and governance items or uh, used in this uh, 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 conversation initiatives that make direct reference to AI in the, in the African region. And it covers quite a, 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 a broad period from um, 1960 to 2023. Um, those this, this, um, initiatives are, are categorized uh, in various ways, uh, first, they, some are categorized as laws, uh, uh, some are categorized as policies, some as reports, some as organizations or projects. Uh, currently, across the region, there is no um, uh, major treaty or law or standard when it comes to AI governance. Uh, when it comes to policies, there are just about two to three of them. And when it comes to organizations and projects that are currently all working on AI governance, there are about 25 of them. So I wanted to give uh, just about a high level summary of what, it, what is happening with respect to initiatives across the region. And these initiatives cover at least um, 17 policy areas, including access to information and accountability, data sharing and management, digital connectivity and computing and so on. Generally, um, these initiatives are led by government, uh, multilateral organizations, public funded research, academia and the private sector. And the jurisdiction this initiative cover uh, include the national, the, the national, uh, we were looking at um, countries like uh, Mauritius, uh, Kenya and Egypt already have uh, a kind of um, uh, AI, uh, uh, national AI policy. Then we have regional initiatives such as the AU Working Group on AI, uh, and also documents that refer tangentially to 
uh, the, the regulation and governance of artificial intelligence systems, such as digital transformation strategy that covers from 2020 to, 2020 to 2030, then also the African Union data policy framework. Then we also have jurisdiction like global jurisdiction like the OECD AI uh, uh, initiatives and also subnational initiatives. Um, quickly, that said, artificial intelligence governance in Africa is still very much in the, at its infancy. And most approaches for now are soft, but we already seen growing interest towards a hard law approach. And um, that was just a recent example from, for example, the Kenyan government that has signified interest to now pass a law uh, with respect to uh, uh, regulating uh, uh, AI systems. However, while governance may tarry for a while, interests are increasing from diverse key stakeholders such as governments, businesses, civil society, regional institutions, and many others. What this signals is that governance will not only catch up, we not only have to catch up, I mean, and, but when it does, it needs to be dynamic and respond to the unique challenges faced by, by Africa as a region in order to ensure that we do not replicate ongoing inequalities. I will stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, finally, let's go to Irakli uh, Khodeli, who is a program specialist uh, for UNESCO to introduce their initi uh, initiatives in this, uh, in this area. Um, thank you very much, Michael. Good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting UNESCO to join this panel. Uh, my name is Irakli Kodeli, as announced. I'm from the Ethics of Science and Technology team of UNESCO, and I'll be contributing to our discussion today from a specific angle, angle of the UNESCO's recommendation on ethics of AI, um, focusing on the tool as um, for its proven potential to guide countries uh, on AI governance and AI regulation. The recommendation was adopted. So, in a way, um, I'll be very happy to be bringing in a global perspective on AI governance. Uh, global because the recommendation that I've mentioned was adopted almost two years ago by 193 member states of UNESCO. Uh, it is grounded in overarching fundamental values, uh, such as human rights, human dignity, diversity, environmental sustainability, uh, peaceful societies. And then these uh, broad values are translated into 10 principles. Um, there was a lot of mention of the principles already. Uh, there is uh, perhaps nothing new in the UNESCO principles either. Some of, for instance, Kyoko has mentioned some of the principles that were guiding the national discussions in Japan and, and also OECD principles were mentioned. What does make UNESCO's uh, framework um, distinctive is the emphasis, specific emphasis on gender because UNESCO believes that this should be actually disassociated from the general discussion on, on discrimination because there are some uh, specific and, and severe harms and threats to gender uh, diversity, uh, gender equality. And it, there's also an emphasis on environmental sustainability because oftentimes in the global discussions, this, uh, this is uh, under um, uh, overlooked, this dimension. Um, and then finally, these values and principles are translated into concrete policy action areas by the recommendation to show the governments how you you can actually operationalize these principles in specific policy contexts, whether this is um, uh, education and, and, and scientific research, whether it's economy and labor, whether it's um, um, healthcare and, and social well-being, uh, etc. There are uh, 11 different <laughs> communication and information. There are 11 different policy areas um, of their rec recommendation. Now, um, uh, there has been, as you're aware, uh, a lot of discussion globally uh, focusing on the risks posed by AI, ranging from benign to catastrophic and from unintended to very much uh, intended and deliberate uh, harms. Um, and and uh, we understand that the risks are significant um, and, and these risks are also cross-border. Uh, uh, this uh, AI also is closely related to pillars of the UN, such as sustainable development, human rights, gender equality, peace. So in this sense, uh, a UN-led effort, uh, in our view, is critical, not only because AI requires a global multilateral forum for governance, but also because unregulated AI 
could undermine other multilateral priorities like the sustainable development goals and, and, and others. So what I would like to postulate today in our discussion is that UNESCO's recommendation represents a, a comprehensive normative background that can guide the design and operation of the global governance mechanism. I will end with saying that despite this focus on the global uh, governance, uh, we must admit that the successful regulation happens at the national level. Ultimately, it is the national governments uh, that are responsible for setting up institutions and, and laws for AI governance. And here, again, uh, uh, the recommendation on ethics of AI comes in handy because we are currently uh, working with governments around the world, both in the global north and global south, uh, to help them uh, make a concrete use of this recommendation uh, by uh, reinforcing their institutions and, and, and the regulatory frameworks based on this overall ethical uh, framework. Thank you very much. Really looking forward to engaging with these discussions with you. Max, so I think that's a fantastic um, framing of different initiatives as they're taking place in different parts of the world and by different agencies. Uh, I want to start now by opening things up with a discussion of the North South, global North, global South, majority world, minority world dynamics that are at play in um, the broader regulatory landscape, and particularly the pressures from standard setting emerging from major regulatory blocks and the challenges that that creates in trying to make space for, um, particularly for smaller nations or for voices from the majority world. Um, why don't we, uh, I think that S Simon might be a good place um, to start there in terms of, uh, 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 the challenges um, that, that smaller nations face in, in trying to make their own way from a regulatory uh, perspective, um, and then we'll um, maybe go to someone, someone else from there. Sure, thanks so much, uh, and, and again, it's great to be part of this conversation. I think as Carlos said earlier, there is a kind of, there are phases that countries go through. It starts with principles, uh, but indeed those principles themselves um, this sort of uh, set of ideas that, as Iraqli said now, we've seen in the UNESCO document, uh, you can actually trace their origins back through primarily Western technology companies. It was around 2016 to 2018 that uh, Western technology companies, partly because it was around that time that the Cambridge Analytica scandal revealed to many that the risks of errant AI went beyond a weird Amazon recommendation or a biased credit or hiring decision to actually potentially impacting elections. Uh, and now we've seen with generative AI, everyone's suddenly realizing that AI could actually affect their, their jobs. So we've seen this spread around the world, uh, and it is now, I think, a truly global discourse. Uh, but there are three challenges, I think, facing small countries in particular. Um, the first is the one I've already highlighted, the, the sort of whether to regulate. Because if you're a small jurisdiction and you regulate too quickly, one of the concerns is that all you will do is drive innovation elsewhere. Uh, that can happen to big countries as well. An example of this is when in 2001, the United States imposed a moratorium on stem cell research, and that really just led to a lot of that research moving elsewhere. So that's the first question, whether to regulate uh, for fear of driving innovation elsewhere. Uh, the second is when to regulate. And here, uh, there's a useful idea that some of you might be familiar with called the Collingridge Dilemma. This goes back to David Collingridge, a book called The Social Control of Technology. And basically what he argued back in 1980 is that an early stage of innovation, regulation is easy, but you don't know what the harms are. You don't know what you should do. Uh, and the, the risk of overregulation is significant. The longer you wait, however, the clearer the harms become, but also the cost of regulation goes way up. Uh, and so I think, again, for smaller jurisdictions, there is this wariness of losing out uh, on the benefits of artificial intelligence. And as we carry on this discussion, I do think it's important to, to keep in mind that there are risks associated with over-regulating as well as under-regulating AI. The third challenge, uh, and this faces many countries around the world, but again, in particular, smaller countries, is that in many ways, the biggest shift over the past decade of machine learning uh, is the extent to which fundamental research as well as application has moved from public to private hands. Back 10 years ago, at the start of the machine learning uh, revolution, a lot of the research was going on in publicly funded universities. Now, a decade later, almost all of it is happening in private institutions, in companies. Uh, and that means a couple of things. Firstly, it means it greatly shortens the, the speed of deployment from an idea to application. And we've seen that in generative AI in particular. 
but secondly, again, it limits the ability of governments to constrain behaviour, to nudge behaviour, or even to be involved in the, the, the deployment cycle. So with those ideas, I'll, I'll hold off. But again, I'm really looking forward to an exchange of views. Thank you. Great. Let's go to Carlos next. And then I would like to hear from someone in the room. Uh, so uh, uh, please express your interest now if you're interested in, in intervening in this. And since we're talking about regulation, of course, uh, architecture is a form of regulation as well. And the architecture of this room might be non-inviting uh, for people to, 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 to come up and provide their, their ideas and to join the conversation. So please feel, feel free to do that. And just to, and just to like, uh, offer a quick, quick segue on uh, what Simon was saying, uh, one challenge that we might face when we think about uh, governance and regulation of AI uh, in the majority world is that AI might be invisible, might be something really ethereal, hard to grasp on how regulators could enter into this discussion to begin with. And of course, that will end up creating the effect that examples that we can take out from uh, different countries that have already regulated this topic end up as, uh, creating uh, a very strong influence on the models, the categories, the way in which this conversation is actually being set up in, in, those, in those countries. And we now face a challenge because we want countries from the majority world to be protagonists uh, in the discussion about governance and regulation of AI. But at the same time, uh, when we think about especially the largest countries in the majority world, they end up serving mostly as a resource for users uh, of the AI uh, most famous applications than anything else. And this is, I think, uh, something that we need to pay extra attention because when we think about the regulation and the governance of AI, we need to think about uh, what we are trying to, to communicate, what we're addressing, because one thing is the deployment uh, and the creation and the design of AI, and another thing is the usage of this AI application. And when it comes to the majority world, we can see pretty often that the applications were not going to be designed, created in those countries, but they will be used heavily in those countries. So it's, um, it's quite obvious that so the discussion about how to regulate not only the creation, but also the use of those applications will be key. Uh, for the successful experiences of those initiatives on, on, on regulation and governance. But I'll just stop here, Michael. Perfect. Let's go um, here to the back and then um, over this way afterwards. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Ali Mahmood, I'm from Pakistan. I'm heading a, um, a provincial government entity that is involved in policy making. Uh, it was interesting to listen to Simon who uh, mentioned that under regulation and over regulation both uh, you know, there has to be a balance. And um, uh, the, the thing is that we have a national AI policy. It's a draft, it's in the draft stage, and we're currently, currently getting uh, input from a lot of stakeholders. Um, now, it does touch upon the aspect of generative AI because it's a newer phenomena, but it's had a really disruptive effect in so many ways. And we talk about the ethical use of AI, but uh, as long as generative AI, for example, I'll consider a use case that as long as it's assistive in nature, it's acceptable. Um, but beyond that, it can be considered unethical. So I just want to learn from the panelists that how can we strike a balance uh, over there so that, because, you know, uh, if at the govern government level, if we look at the education sector, uh, there are a lot of problems already, uh, you know, being uh, raised by different government institutions, educational institutions, universities, that, you know, generative AI is misused. So uh, at a policy level, uh, I would like to know, uh, I mean, how can we address this problem? Thank you. All right, thanks very much. Uh, Slee Ming Zhu from Australian uh, the National Science Agency. So we uh, basically, our staff chairs Australian's AI standards body, 
and, and also we developed Australian uh, ethical AI principles back in uh, 2019. So as a science agency, interestingly, we are not allowed to comment on policy uh, and, and regulation uh, because we provide scientific evidence uh, in, into these policy discussions. But I think I want to raise two points. One is, no matter the standardization and the uh, policy and the regulation, you need to measure the risks, the size of the risks. And that's a scientific question. And we need to have an international research alliance on how to measure those risks. Once you fully understand how to measure those risks, then you can probably reduce those risks and um, make a very informed decision. The second point I want to make is a lot of these are trade-offs decisions. Uh, only uh, those risks are well understood and measured, you can make those trade-offs. For example, when US uh, Statistical Bureau uh, released their data for further research, they have to make a very concrete uh, trade-off between you, uh, data utility and privacy. You have to make a conscious decision to sacrifice some privacy uh, for the gain of some benefits. And that uh, informed decision is done by a stakeholder groups uh, from privacy advocates. Um, but it's even more complex uh, than that. After uh, they did that, I think there are studies coming out to say, actually, privacy, utility, and the fairness, they all have trade-offs, uh, having privacy preserving uh, approaches sometimes harm fairness and sometimes promote uh, fairness. You have to have the fairness uh, foundation to that as well. And many of these are context driven. I don't know whether people have seen the recent uh, ChatGPT vision system model. And they basically said uh, one of the use cases they have is blind people uh, wanting to have face recognition. That's the number one feature they requested. Because blind people to say, I just want to have the same level of um, ability of normal humans to in a room to, to recognize face. But based on face recognition risks and, and the various uh, legislations, they are not allowed to have that. And that's the number one feature they have requested. But I, I think that's an interesting discussion to say how the standardization and policy and the science will enable this kind of trade-off decisions. Thank you. Milton, did you? So. I just uh, wanted to raise a question about something. I can't remember which panelist said that uh, when we talk about regulation, we're necessarily talking fundamentally about national governments. And if you look at what AI consists of, break it down into its component parts, as Courtney said, uh, you're looking at a combination, really, of data resources, software programs, networks and um, devices, computing devices, and all of those are globalized markets and with the internet, and here's where I'm trying to create a link to internet governance, which is what this forum is supposed to be about, although we might want to rename it the AIGF. Um, the, the internet makes it all very easy to distribute applications and to distribute data resources uh, very quickly and uh, hard to control. So uh, I understand that many forms of uh, applications will be regulated at the national level, like medical devices or something, uh, where you have a nicely defined thing. But, but AI as a whole um, is going to be a very globalized uh, form of human interaction, and I don't think that national governments are all going to solve this by themselves. Um, let's, let's hear from uh, Tamiwa, uh, and then uh, maybe uh, one more intervention, and then we'll move on to the next, uh, next question. Thank you very much, Michael. And um, discussing not-south dynamics, especially from an African perspective when it comes to AI governance, for me, I think the race towards global AI governance will favor the bold. And while I will not delve into the ethics of that um, sentence, it is the reality, especially in Africa, especially uh, with, with how um, the region is often bedeviled with importation, especially of standards, and sometimes even being referred to only as standard stickers, not people who design standards for themselves. And we know uh, in international law, as it is in international politics, uh, smaller nations are seldom bold and they often end up as pawns or testing grounds for bad governance uh, attempts. However, in my view, uh, smaller nations in this context uh, can be bold if they strategize and work together with like-minded initiatives or systems. 
And when I use the word small, I also use small in terms of progress uh, uh, with AI governance and initiatives on the ground. Um, it is, the way I see it, uh, it is a long way for small nation to, to move alone. But that journey towards responsible AI governance could be shorter if worked with others who may share um, maybe similar goals and intended results. Uh, that would be my uh, quick contribution on that. Thanks. So let's go to one more intervention from the room, and then I'm going to move on to Yeah, uh, Janet Hoffman, um, Germany. Um, I have a question to Simon Chesterman um, on the situation in Singapore. You pointed out that Singapore is a small jurisdiction and thereby always face the risk of driving companies out of the country. But I was thinking of the fact that Singapore has quite a number of really successful companies under public ownership. So I was wondering whether that not creates perfect conditions for regulatory sandboxes where you can in fact test what type of regulation works and what effects it has on the companies. Sure, Simon, did you want to uh, respond to that? Sure. Uh, so it's a great question. And indeed, um, regulatory sandboxes is something we've been exploring, in particular in the fintech sector. The Monetary Authority of Singapore has used this technique, which um, is not, not unique to Singapore. But the basic idea is you give a kind of safe regulatory playground where there are reduced risks uh, that enables companies to test out new use cases. Um, but uh, the larger point about um, the danger of driving innovation elsewhere really is a concern not limited to Singapore's domestic economy, but to attracting um, the, the big tech companies, apart from anything else, to Singapore, which we saw um, 11 years ago when Singapore adopted the Personal Data Protection Act. Its legislation was specifically uh, said to be aiming at balancing the rights of users against the legitimate needs of business. Uh, and so I think the combination of the small size, the openness to the world, and the, the regulatory flexibility of a country like Singapore does give us an opportunity, uh, but we've still got to operate within those kind of constraints. Uh, maybe if it's appropriate, I can very quickly just respond to earlier comments. Um, the, the, I didn't catch his name, but the gentleman from Pakistan, uh, one of the key arguments that I think needs to be spread around the world about the use of generative AI is that if you're going to use these things in particular, if you're going to use them in a public sector context, you've got to keep in, in mind two things. Firstly, um, that if you share data with these generative AI systems like ChatGPT and, the, and, the, and similar um, capabilities, um, you're essentially sharing that data with private agencies. So you need to be very careful what you share. The second is uh, it needs to be clear that whatever comes out of it, if you use that, you are responsible for it. Uh, and then really quickly, Li Ming, um, great to see you at a distance even, uh, and I think it was Milton. Um, I'd link both those two to say that um, the levels of regulation that we're talking about, you need to think of three. We do need the regulatory hammer. As Iraqli said, you do need um, states are the only uh, entities with real coercive powers that are going to be essential for harsh regulation when that's needed, uh, and that's going to be an important level. But above and below that, you also need self-regulation, you need industry standards, you need um, interoperability that will in practice be the most common um, form of regulatory intervention, that kind of standard setting. Uh, and above, you also do need some measure of coordination, not just coordination of standards, which is what I think Milton was talking about, but also to Li Ming's point, you need the ability to share information about crises. Uh, and so I won't go into it now, but elsewhere I've written as others have about possible comparisons with the International Atomic Energy Agency and the efforts to share information about safe uses of nuclear power in exchange for a promise not to weaponize that, uh, that technology. I want to, um, thanks. I want to um, pick up on something, um, on, on what you mentioned previously about the Calling Ridge dilemma for the next um, question. In so far as, um, you know, this is, uh, we're in relatively early phases of it. Um, there, there are a lot of unknowns of this technology, but there are also um, a lot of clear manifestations um, of, of potential and existing harms. Um, so that the, 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 the regulatory questions are, not in, are, are, are certainly not speculative on this, um, but we are in the relatively early um, 
uh, phases of implementation, wide, uh, wide scale implementation at least. Um, are there lessons to be drawn from previous eras of tech governance in how we approach um, the regulatory picture? Are there successes and failures of previous regulatory frameworks that can teach us about what works and what doesn't? Maybe I'll go to Courtney on this um, first. Um, thanks so much. Yeah, so my work has primarily focused on the so-called global south or, or majority world um, with a focus on the Middle East. And I think if you look at previous eras of tech governance, whether it's social media, search, app stores, online marketplaces, um, even standards, they were all rolled out and they remain controlled by a few monopolistic tech firms. And so we need to really take this as instructive. The debate about AI governance has failed to grapple with the issue of market power. We are taking the economic ownership and control of AI as a given. And while the discussions around how to prevent AI from inflicting harm are important, and the, the issues of preventing exploitation and discrimination are absolutely necessary, they will meet with limited success if they are not accompanied by bold action to prevent a few firms from dominating the market. I think that is the biggest takeaway. No matter how well we design our rules, we will struggle to enforce them effectively on corporations that are too large to control, that can treat fines as the cost of doing business, and that can decide to simply, for example, censor news in, in an entire country if they don't want to comply with a law, as we saw Meta do in Canada recently. So I think that we have to look at AI, again, in its component parts, um, as I mentioned earlier, and think about the dominance that we're already seeing by literally a handful of big tech firms that are um, providing the leading AI foundation models. Um, they are taking aggressive steps to co-opt independent rivals through investment, partnership agreements, and their dominance over, for example, key cloud computing platforms. We know that between Meta and Google and Amazon, for example, nearly a thousand startup firms were bought with no merger oversight, no FTC intervention. This has to change because I think, you know, as we've discussed, the, the kind of small, large divide, the big economy, small economies, um, this is kind of relevant, but also irrelevant when you have massive firms that are creating new capabilities, um, creating new technologies that national governments do not have uh, power over. And so I think that we have to look at uh, reshaping the structure of markets and ensuring that we crack down on anti-competitive practices in the cloud market, look at uh, common carrier rules so that for example, regulators should be considering forcing Microsoft, Amazon, and Google to divest their cloud businesses in order to eliminate the conflicts of interest that incentivize them to self-preference, for example, their own AI models over those of rivals, as we have seen in app stores, in search, in the way that Amazon constrains and forces small businesses to uh, comply with the rules it sets, because if you're not on Amazon Marketplace, it's very hard for you to do business in many countries. If you're not on Google Search, you might as well not exist if you're a news organization. So there's much to be learned, but we need to get out of this idea that this is somehow some you know new, really scary thing that we're trying to govern be like, all right, again, the components, data. How do we separate out data, com computational power, um, software, applications, um, you know, cloud computing, and think about each of those component parts, as well as thinking about risk assessments, you know, these, these um, more risk frameworks that are really at a far end of the application layer and implications of a certain subset of AI systems. Yeah, the multi-dimensional nature of how power is, is concentrating is certainly well taken. Um, let's, uh, if, we're, if we're thinking about a longer view of these, of, of, of technological developments and regulation, maybe let's go back to um, uh, Iraqi at UNESCO, uh, who certainly has been a, a, a present through, through uh, uh, UNESCO at least has been present through a lot of these different eras of, of, of governance and, and uh, would be interested to hear from, um, hear their thoughts. Uh, sure, thank you very much, uh, Michael, and also to all the other participants for very insightful comments and, and discussion. Um, this is actually a really nice uh, question for me to um, also get back to something that uh, Milton has mentioned in terms of um, the difficulty 
for member states to uh, govern uh, something that is uh, so cross-border uh, in, in, in nature. Uh, and that has to do with things like the flow of data across borders, internet, etc. cetera. Um, uh, because that relates to, you know, how have we, uh, are there cases where we have successfully regulated an emerging technology? And my answer there goes that you need to have, uh, and I might be reiterating uh, some of the points that uh, Simon uh, has made and other um, uh, speakers have made, is that you, uh, the successful regulation of any technology, um, in our view, uh, takes uh, regulatory frameworks existing at different levels. Um, of course, at the global level, um, uh, you, uh, th th that's precisely, again, responding to, to, to Milton's questions, that's why uh, that's precisely why you need a global governance mechanism that coordinates uh, and ensures uh, compatibility and interoperability you know between different uh, layers of of uh, of regulation usually at the global level you have the uh, softest level of regulation it could be a declaration it could be a recommendation but it could also be a convention which would be a more binding uh, document and this is what at the international level right now at the un level that's uh, what the conversation is about is what kind of a regulatory mechanism that you have then let's not forget the importance of the regional organizations and and, and regional arrangements of course uh, european union comes uh, immediately to mind, and it has been mentioned many, many times, but ideally we would want to have the same type of movement within African Union, within uh, ASEAN um, in, in, in Asia, um, Council of Europe already has, um, has a, a movement toward to a, a concrete process towards uh, um, an instrument, um, of course, OECD. So um, a regional organization, uh, uh, regional regulation would be very important. Then again, national. We cannot avoid the fact that whether it comes to redressing uh, cases where harm has been done or, or enforcement of different mechanisms, then the national level is the indispensable. And let's not also forget subnational level. Uh, Courtney has mentioned, for instance, a lot of uh, uh, state level activity on AI regulation. We're also aware that in other countries also uh, similar processes exist. For in, in India, for instance, there there is a, um, a lot of legislative activism at the at the um, state level um, uh, uh, below the national level. So. All of these different levels, I, I think, can uh, effectively uh, work together to uh, regulate the technology. And I'll uh, end with a, a concrete example. Bioethics, for instance, is something that UNESCO has been uh, engaged for a long time. Simon has mentioned stem cell research. Um, perhaps that is not the best specific example, because maybe uh, for the US, that is an example of overregulation. But uh, bioethics. So we have the Universal Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights um, uh, at UNESCO that all member states, all countries around the world basically, have signed on to. Then you have an example of a, of a more stronger framework, uh, Oviedo Convention of the Council of Europe, also in bioethics that provides more stringent uh, framework. And then that is uh, translated into specific, very uh, bi uh, binding and strong regulation at the country level in the in the European uh, countries uh, to protect people uh, against the risks that are emerging from from biological and medical sciences yeah. Um, yeah. technologies. So that, that that's a concrete example. Yeah, Thanks. I think the, the the structural framing is is helpful. I would add uh, trade associations as well and private sector standard setting bodies as well, which can be enormously influential. Um, I'll also note, though, that you talk about how these different um, levels of, of, of uh, regulation, these different structures can work together. They can also compete and work at cross purposes, um, which, which I think um, adds, adds interesting dimension to how, this, uh, how norms get set and applied. Um, let's go to another comment in the room and then to Carlos. Can use this one. Just a moment. We have lots of microphones right here, probably too many. We can diffuse them out. 
So I think the microphone was broken. It was not just my fault. Um, anyway, uh, Ingrid Volkmer, University of Melbourne, Digital Policy. Um, I think this debate about power is really interesting. And it's power between, or new power dynamics rather, between the global north and south, where the Western companies, situ I mean, producing a lot of data across the world, et cetera, et cetera, we've addressed that. But I think there is another dimension, and that is the granulation of data. Because in the global south, perhaps there is not the same, there's not the same quality of fine granulated data that's um, available in the global north. So through that process alone, I think there is a lot of risk that could be produced uh, through AI, and I don't know a solution to that. I know that the ITU has a lot of initiatives around AI for good, with farming and medical, etc., in the global south, but I think this issue of data granulation is perhaps also another one that could be addressed in the power debate we're having. Thank you. Super quickly, uh, since we are discussing like uh, what are the lessons learned uh, on the uh, at least 25 years of uh, thinking about uh, internet regulation, maybe one thing we should take into account is that like uh, copyright and freedom of expression like were the, the two issues uh, addressed like early on uh, on the regulation of the the internet, and by the time social media. Uh, end up uh, appearing in the global scenario. We had this surge of uh, personal data protection laws uh, that was fundamental for us to understand what uh, internet regulation uh, looks like uh, in the last decade. So when we shift gears into the discussion about AI regulation, uh, looks like we have at least two very interesting questions. Uh, in comparison to this experience that we had uh, with the regulation of the internet. So first one is like how much the modeling of personal data protection laws, uh, such as concerning about risk analysis, will end up influencing the way in which uh, AI regulation will be shaped. Uh, and the second one is the decisions that were end up being taken on uh, um, the, the issue of um, um, uh, platform liability uh, in different countries, in different regions, and how can we, uh, to, uh, uh, dis on a certain way, uh, take that into the discussion about uh, the damages caused by, by AI? Because it looks like, first of all, we need to ask ourselves what type of AI we're talking about, what type of damages are we talking about, and especially, I think, we have an entirely different discussion when it comes to, to AI, because when it comes to AI, we have this opportunistic uh, discussion in which if uh, the AI application end up causing trouble and damage to other people, the AI application is dumb and you have, oh, sorry, quite the opposite. The AI application is super smart, and the robot, the application, decides on itself to cause the harm. But on the opposite end, when the AI application end up providing you profit, such as like uh, in the discussion about copyright, you want the machine or the application to be as dumb as possible. So you as a developer, you as the deployer of the AI, you end up having all the profits of having this type of application out there in the market. So I think this is a type of discussion that we didn't have back then in the discussion about internet regulation. And this is very unique to the discussions that we have right now on AI. This opportunistic usage of the autonomy of the AI application, and I think this put us in a very different set of questions. Yeah, I think, I think the copyright example, anytime you're talking about learning from previous eras of, of regulation, the copyright example is incredibly salient. And, and I would say, um, I think that even today, enforcement of IP rights online today is vastly stronger than, say, enforcement of privacy rights. And the reason for that, it's, it's entirely a legacy of the early prioritization of harms that were viewed as the most, the most pressing and the most urgent to address early on in that regulatory, uh, uh, regulatory um, early on in regulatory efforts. And I think, you know, the point about needing to be 
deliberate and careful in selecting how harms are understood and prioritized in, in the current regulatory, uh, as, as, we, as we grapple with um, developing new regulations now, is incredibly important because this, this, this will ripple forward over time um, as these technologies uh, uh, continue to proliferate. And, yeah, 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 just to, to build on that, I mean, I think we have to think about also that there's a political economy of the protocols that are created by technical standard setting bodies. This idea that, for example, robot TXT, you know, that's a standard or HTTP versus HTTPS are standards that were created in technical communities without necessarily considering the political economic implications of the abilities that were being created through those standards. And so to build on you know, your two points here on copyright, the ability to just hoover up all of this rights protected data to create large language models without any compensation to content creators, news producers, et cetera, has huge repercussions on the economics of certain industries. In my, my own work, I focus on the journalism industry, but also then on broader society, work, et cetera. And so I think we need to take that into consideration that technical standards are not neutral. They have political economic impacts. And we have to think about neutralizing big tech's unfairly acquired data advantage proactively. And we should think about the fact that a representative from Meta stood on the AI high-level panel as a representative. We are recreating a lot of the problems of the past by elevating the same big tech companies versus seeing a greater diversity um, of, of technology and technical community. You have an overabundance of the big tech representatives and corporate tech representatives in a lot of the multi-stakeholder processes. So we need to, I think, reorient that. Okay, so we're, we're doing a lot of beating up on big tech and, and, and uh, the tech sector at the moment. So let me ask then, uh, the, the next question that I wanted to get to is, what is the appropriate role for industry in regulation and standard setting? Um, what does it mean to have meaningful uh, multi-stakeholder engagement? I want to go to the room. To, there, where, so we, had, uh, we have one over there, and I want to know, if, is anybody here from either industry, from tech sector, who could contribute as well, either here or from the back? No? Uh, yes, uh, well, 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 let's go to the corner first. Test. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. This is Guo Wu, who actually from TWIGF. In it's kind of interesting. I learned the uh, natural language processing in the 1980. I don't know how many of you is, uh, you know, uh, learning the natural language processing in the early days. And it's re really a, a big difference between the 1984 and now. Because in the early day, we are talking about the algorithm, but this day we are talking about a massive database. You know, the machine is learning from the massive of the database. But I don't know anybody to have a study in this kind of situation. Because uh, today, the AI is learning from massive of the database. But the problem is, let's try to think about a two group. A group is a group of the people that produce the huge data, and such the machine can learn from this uh, huge data from the group A. And thinking about it, there's another group of the people. They don't produce a lot of data. That means machine cannot learn enough from this group B. Now when the AI machine, after this uh, whole study, and then try to generate their comment or whatever the, 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 the result. Is that is a possible? Because of this data is less, this is, this is more. So there will be generate kind of discrimination to the group B and prefer the group A. I don't know anybody study such of a case. Okay, I'm going to make one more call for anybody from um, private sector or industry uh, to um, uh, discuss 
uh, the role of the private sector in, in regulation and in crafting good regulations and standard setting. If nobody speaks up, you don't get to complain if our, if our outcome document is, is, is not fair. Um, so well, let, let, let me frame it this way then. I mean, we hear a lot about multi-stakeholderism. What, what does it mean to have a meaningful multi-stakeholder process in terms of crafting either standards or regulation in this space? Um, why don't we go to Kyoko first and then someone in the room who would like to, to chime in or in the Zoom? So um, let me talk about the industry role. Um, industry should consider developing or using responsible AI as part of their corporate social responsibility or as part of their environmental, social, and governance ESG practices. Um, since the way in which they um, develop and sell or use AI will have huge impact on society as a whole. So I would like to point um, three main things that org what organizations can do. One is to create guidelines on the development and use of AI, including a code of conduct, internal R&D guidelines, and AI utilization principles, and provide publicly accessible documents such as AI policy on how the organization develops and utilizes AI systems, like we did for privacy policy. And this is very meaningful, and I know this because um, I was uh, working in a think tank, um, developing AI systems. I was in charge of AI risk management and compliance. But when we made those and we made AI policy uh, publicly available, you know, all the people involved in this um, developing AI process will have responsible, will be really responsible in making those ethically. And so it's like a manifestation, but I think this manifestation is very important and effective for the develop developer companies and user companies to be responsible for making um, and using AI appropriately. And many companies um, in Japan, like Sony, Fujitsu, NEC, NTT Data, they already developed AI policies um, based on the uh, guidelines which I mentioned at the beginning. And it seems to be working well even if we have um, non-binding guidelines, soft law approach. Um, I'm seeing a similar situation now um, of what I've seen back in 2005. Um, in 2005, uh, Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry created, created what we call information security governance policy framework. Um, at that time, you know, there were many um, information security incidents and the government realized that we need to do something. And I was um, in a think tank assisting that, assisting to make that um, information security governance policy framework. But we made um, three tools um, for establishing information security governance. One is we made an information security benchmark to help organization rigorously and compre comprehensively self-assess the gap between their organization's current condition and the desirable level of um, information security. Um, second, we made a model for information security re reporting to encourage um, companies to disclose their information security efforts. And three, um, we made a guideline for business continuity planning to encourage companies to develop such plans. Now this initiative has led many companies to build robust um, information security governance. So in the context of AI governance, um, creating informed frameworks may encourage management to establish robust AI governance within their organization, perhaps you know, functioning as part of their ESG um, efforts. So let's uh, go to Simon next and then um, someone else in the room if, uh, if, if they want to join in, if they want to chime in. 
Thanks. Yeah, on the, on the role of companies, I do I do think it's sort of amazing how things have changed. Um, so back in 2011, Ryan Carlo, who's a great scholar in this area, wrote something very silly, I think, where he argued that in order to encourage research into AI, we needed to give companies immunity from suit. Otherwise, the risks uh, would be so great that they wouldn't innovate. Now, clearly that hasn't happened. Jump forward to today, and you've got companies lining up to call for regulation. Um, but they're doing that for at least three reasons. One reason is, um, I think many of them do actually accept that some regulation would be useful. Second, they know that some kind of regulation is coming. They'd like to be part of that conversation. Um, but thirdly, especially for the big market players, they know that if the regulatory costs go up, that becomes additional barriers to entry for their competitors. So it's good for them. Um, so by all, by all means, I think it's important to involve companies in these processes. And I, I, I echo what um, Kyoko and others have said about uh, the importance of standards, the importance of these emerging uh, interoperable um, standards is going to be very, very important. But we're also going to be clear eyed about the incentives that drive these companies, which is to make money. Uh, which is one reason why a lot of this stuff that's being deployed now um, is really seems to be uh, making money in two ways that that, that have been uh, revealed as the sort of money making uh, aspects of AI. The first is to monetize human attention, and we've seen that through the surveillance um, capitalism, the, the experience of social media, uh, and the second is to replace human labor. Uh, and so, for all these reasons, I, I do think it's important to involve companies but also to understand that their role is, yes, they've got to pay attention to ESG and so on, the triple bottom line, but ultimately they are businesses. And if we, the community, or if regulators make a determination that these companies are too big, then it's necessary to either, you, you've got three choices. You've got the litigation path, which the US is going down at the moment with the slim, slim possibility that some of these um, FTC or DOJ actions might actually lead up to the lead to the breaking up of companies. You've got the European approach, which is say, okay, we're just going to identify gatekeepers, and these six companies are now going to be subject to much heavier regulation. Or you've got the Chinese approach, which is to say, well, just through executive action, Alibaba is going to be broken up into six companies uh, and uh, and address the problem that way. So yes, by all means, I think it's important to involve companies, but also to understand their perspectives, where they're coming from. Uh, and not expect them to be turkeys that vote in favor of Christmas. Yeah, I think that that leads pretty neatly to the, to the next question that I wanted to um, uh, raise, which is related to risk-based versus rights-based approaches towards regulation and challenges of, um, not to say self-regulation, because uh, I think that there's probably going to be good consensus in, the, in, in this room and, and in most rooms that, that um, we don't want to, uh, we're not satisfied with a self-regulatory solution. But um, the emphasis within a lot of early regulatory models on self-assessment and risk assessment as a critical component of um, regulatory structures, that's uh, an important part, uh, an important um, part of um, the EU's uh, uh, regulation in this space, um, draft regulation in this space. Um, in the U.S., the AI Commission bill um, has explicitly endorsed uh, a risk-based um, assessment model. Um, are there thoughts on, you know, challenges and, and, and the role of this kind of assessment in effective regulation, um, the role of companies in carrying out these assessments, uh, uh, challenges in finding an effective um, avenue towards um, uh, uh, in developing an effective framework if, it's, if it relies on um, internal assessments by companies and, and the need to, to develop that in a robust way. Milton? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the, I think the uh, risk assessment approach that is in one American bill and in the European bills are, are kind of a joke. Uh, basically, they are asking for self-assessments and this is not because I'm anti-industry and don't trust them to do this. I think it's just going to be a ticking the box exercise. And the point that I think that we need to think about is that you don't know what the risks are going to be in many cases. These things don't exist yet, right? And so you cannot, you know, that's what makes me laugh about the European model. So people are supposed to sort themselves into the five different, different risk levels, but uh, how do you know? 
what the risk is until it happens. And so I don't believe in this kind of ex ante forms of regulation where the, the government pretends that it is all knowing and it, it th thinks it can decide. And I'd like to bring, bring your attention more to a rights-based approach based on property rights, which is whenever you have a new technology, you create new forms of property. So we saw this in the domain name industry, uh, Michael. We saw, uh, you know, these things were nothing. They were filled, given out for free, and then suddenly they were valuable, and they conflicted with trademark rights. So we had a policy-making process ex post where we figured out who had a right to what. And now with so-called surveillance capitalism, we are discovering the value of data resources and we have, you know, to renegotiate the boundary between who owns or who controls what data uh, when users interact with platforms. And I think it's a mistake to view that as this extraction process where a helpless human just gets data taken away from them by, you know, you're, you're engaged in an exchange. You are getting something and you are giving up something and, and we have to decide how that data gets monitored and owned and regulated, and that's not an easy problem. So I would think that with, with AI, the issue is going to be a lot about property rights, and, and it's interesting to see how we're replaying some of the conservative protectionist stuff about copyright now that uh, you, you, you know, remember when we started the internet, some, some copyright people were saying every time you move a file from one server to another, you're making an illegitimate copy, right? And that would have killed the internet. They wanted uh, the definition of property rights in, in digital items to be so strict that uh, we, we simply would not have had an internet. So we have to be careful about that. Uh, I'll also say, you know, it's interesting because um, regulatory ambiguity in other, in, in, in other use cases can lead to overly cautious approaches if it's accompanied by either aggressive enforcement uh, and or extremely severe penalties. So in, in the speech realm, um, a vague law is always viewed as being really dangerous because if it, if it can be aggressively enforced, people see you're see really clear of the line. Um, but it's just not clear to me that any of the proposed AI regulatory frameworks would incorporate or could incorporate that level of enforcement, uh, uh, and and uh, so that's you know that's why I think it's 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 interesting that ambiguity can work both ways, but it's it's unlikely to work that way in this context. Let's go, Courtney, and then uh, yeah. Yeah, I think one of the problems uh, to definitely agree with Milton on the risk-based approach. You just don't know, and that limits what you're even talking about. We're not talking about, for example, regulation that is aimed at. Um, reclassifying some types of companies as common carriers or having public utility type uh, requirements, um, common carrier requirements, for example. I think that, I mean, yes, the way that we address property rights on the internet gave rise to the internet. On the other hand, the way that we implemented some of those copyrights or lack thereof um, and some of the digital advertising structures that, that um, emerged has killed off a large part of the news media industry, which is considered an essential component to democratic systems. So there is a trade-off. I think we have to think, you know, unfettered innovation is not necessarily good. So I think that the, the, the rights versus risk-based assessment does not get to many of the issues at stake. We talk a lot about individual level data. I think you're right, Milton, you know this user data. There is some exchange, but there's a lot of data that is not individual data. It's sensor data, it's environmental data, it is data about movement and, and data about data that is also incredibly valuable and currently dominated again um, by larger firms that have more access to data, et cetera. So we have to, I think, really, I, I feel like the rights and the risk-based approach are important for a specific subset of AI, particularly when we're talking about maybe generative AI, decision-making AI systems in certain sectors, but that is only a small component of AI, and we have to think about public interest-oriented regulation um, and a wider set of policy interventions. So let's, um, did you raise your, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sorry. 
Thank you. I wanted to respond to Milton and politely disagree. First of all, um, I mean, <laughs> no, that's nothing new. Uh, it, uh, my, my objection concerns uh, the fact that you think it's ridiculous to ask platforms to assess the risks. Uh, first of all, uh, all companies have uh, lots of experience with risk modeling. As a technique, it's not new to them. They're used to doing that. And now they are asked to uh, assess the risks vis-a-vis -vis some fairly specific groups, vulnerable groups, uh, to well-being, to all sorts of things. And as we know, uh, through various leaks, they know themselves what they are doing to specific uh, user groups. Also, that is not new to them. And finally, um, the DSA gives researchers now privileged access to data uh, produced by platforms in the area of risk. And I think it will be possible to some extent for research to assess how platforms assess the risks they impose on societies. It will be, I think, fairly interesting to see particularly how platforms deal with the question of general risks to society. I have no clue how they're going to operationalize that. They will have to do that to tick boxes, but there are research groups that will be able to hold them account, to account uh, on the ways how they approach this problem. Yeah, I think, um a lot of uh, us uh, poor non-EU researchers are, are jealous of our of our <laughs> colleagues that are that are going to be that are going to be able to do some really interesting research based on that. I, you I still have, need funding to do that, yeah. right? You're you're relying on underfunded civil society and academia to provide oversight of powerful wealthy companies that do their own risk assessments, but may fire the people who find the risks or bury that research. So it's not a perfect solution. All right, so let's, so uh, Carlos, did you want to intervene? And then I think we have a comment on the, on the corner. So just very quickly uh, to react to, to, to Milton's uh, uh, provocative comments on, on, the, on the status of regulation. And uh, I think there's something uh, for us to take into account here is that for countries to have something about regulation of AI, it's almost like a brand, a signal of being part of uh, a group that is uh, thinking about the future. And that's been leading us to situations in which we come up with regulation that are far from perfect, but we keep hearing that in different countries, in different discussions, people say it's better than nothing. So I think this is a, a moment in which uh, we should uh, think about uh, should we be happy with having something that is like better than nothing just to be part of a group uh, of countries that are, have already enacted something? Uh, I think quite the opposite. We are in a very important moment in which we could learn from the experience from abroad, coming up with uh, uh, lessons learned and best practices to come with uh, uh, interesting and innovative uh, solutions, but just to to, to react to Milton's comments, I think that when we look to some, especially thinking about the influence of the European uh, um, solution to some of those topics, we have shadows of the European solutions uh, appearing in different countries, uh, solutions that might not even function properly, but legislators will say, hey, we have done something. So by the end of the day, better than nothing. Yeah, I think there's, there's an interesting tension between the need for the undoubted need and benefits of engagement and mutual learning and sharing best practices um, and the importance of factoring local context into regulatory processes, right? Like, obviously, I, I don't know that the world benefits from, you know, 195 different, radically different frameworks, uh, 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 but, um, you know, it, it's also, it can also be problematic when countries sort of cut and paste, say, an EU model or an American model into their, into their local context, which can either uh, lack an appropriate uh, uh, regulatory structure um, of, of, of related legislation, right, like the EU Act, 
but without the GDPR and without the DSA and without the Digital Markets Act that are also important components of the same regulatory ecosystem. Um, or that, that, that just import a conception of harm that's not necessarily fit for purpose um, based on the local context. Um, we had a comment uh, in the corner. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Sunny. I'm from the National Physical Laboratory of the United Kingdom. Um, there's a few words, and I thought we were drilling towards what I was trying to say earlier on, but it's actually maybe helped me a bit more now that everyone else has spoken. Uh, so the word assessment, I think, is where I'm going to start. And so that's expressly a measurement activity is probably where I would start with that one. So how are we going to measure all these things? So how are we going to measure compliance, performance? How am I going to measure how I can trust a system or that it's safe, depending on the context, because every context is different? So there's a lot of thought. It's a bit of a paradigm shift that's coming, and it's coming in our part of the world as well as um, just generally. And when I mean our part of the world, I mean the measurement part of the world rather than uh, any geographical part. So how do we measure these things? And before standards are things called pre-normative standards, which can be anywhere from two to 20 years in development before you get to the standards. So this is where how you can measure what it says on the tin. And so there's a lot of work that needs to go from that side of things. And so the kind of work that NIST does in America is what NPL does in the UK. So there are 100 signatories to this thing around the world, nation states. So there could be an interesting platform where some collaboration, some multi-stakeholder approach occurs. And the reason I say that is the organizations like us, we sit on that cusp between industry, academia, and civil society. And then just to hit on the uh, what can industry do for us part is we need to collaborate with industry. They provide access. They will provide access to resources, be that compute, be it to the models. They bring us access to case studies and use cases. and. Also, that knowledge and understanding, we can help them, they can help us to help them, because then we open things up and we get different lenses can, uh, can be supported on various things. And then the last thing is this context thing. So it's not just about quantitative measurement, it's about qualitative. So what is a socio-technical test bed to measure the trustworthy outputs of AI actually look like? And that's something that the world needs to work on together. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Kyoko, did you want to? Oh, yeah, please. Yes, um, I understand that the EU, US, and Japan are all taking risk-based um, approach right now. And I think um, it is important to examine what the risks are beforehand. But regulating this risks precautionary with hard law is somewhat dangerous because the risks varies according to context. Also, um, the level of AI technology varies among countries. And so we should not impose like hard law um, to like other countries, um, but to agree with the basic principles and leave it to each country to decide whether to take hard law or software approaches. Um, like factors like corporate culture, you know, if the companies are obedient or not, safety, the level of technology, should all be taken into account how to regulate AI. Um, for example, one of the threats caused by AI is the um, intrusion to privacy. Um, for example, surveillance or real-time biometric ID systems. In that case, it is important to have personal data protection law. And you know, these factors vary among countries, so we should not you know, say this law is better than the other. Um, I think each government should make regulations on their own way, considering their, these factors in their own context. Thanks. Um, so that uh, just about takes us uh, to time. Um, I was a bit uh, daunted when I saw the IGF uh, schedule get released and saw that there were so many different sessions on AI. Um, I'm not going to say that ours is the best. Um, I might put that in our outcome report. But um, I certainly, like, I learned a lot from the perspectives um, expressed here, um, both among our panelists and from the rest of you in the room. Um, and I think that you know, it's an incredibly important conversation 
um, given both the importance and urgency of these challenges and you know this unusual combination of having something that urgently needs attention but it's also incredibly important to, to, to get right. So uh, thanks again to all of our panelists, thanks again um, to all of you for, who participated and I look forward to, to keeping the conversation going. Thanks Michael, thanks everyone. Thanks Michael. Thank you, have a nice day.